Part 1. You are going to hear a conversation. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 7. Listen carefully to the first part of the conversation and answer questions 1 to 7. Rita speaking. What should I do for you? Oh, hi. I'd like to order some stationery. Could I know your name? Jackson Paris. Right. Can I just confirm your account number and the name of your company, Jackson? Sure. The number is 692411. Six nine two four double one. Right. And you're from Rainbow Computer? No, the company is Rainbow Communications. Oh, OK. I'll just fix that on the system. Communications. And what would you like to order, Jackson? Envelopes. We need a box of A4, that is, normal size envelopes. White, yellow or manila? We'll have the plain white, please but the ones with the little windows. OK, one box. A4, white. Just one box, was it? Um, on second thoughts, make those two boxes. We go through heaps of envelopes. As a matter of interest, are they made from recycled paper? No, you can't get white recycled paper. The recycled ones are grey, and they're more expensive, actually. Right, we'll stick to white, then. Something else, Jackson? Yes, we need some coloured photocopy paper. What colours do you have? We've got purple, light blue, blue, light green, whatever you want, pretty much. There are 500 sheets on the pack. Let me see. We're going to need a lot of blue paper for our new price lists. So can you give us 10 packs, please? Make sure it's the light blue, though. 10 packs of the light blue. Anything else that we can help you with? Let me think. What else do we need? I'm sure there was something else. Ends, paper clips, fax paper, computer supplies, office furniture. Oh, yes. We need floppy disks. Do you have those nice coloured ones? Yes, but they're a bit more expensive than the black ones. That's all right. I'm not paying anyway. Right. Floppy disks. What about diaries next year? We've got them in stock already, and it's a good idea to order early. No, I think we're all right for diaries, but something we do need is one of those big wall calendars. You know, one that shows the whole year at a glance. Do you stock those? We certainly do. OK, can you include a wall calendar then, with the other stuff? Just make sure it's got the whole year on the one side. Sure. Now you have some time to look at questions 8 to 10. Now listen to the next part of the conversation and answer questions 8 to 10. And do you have a copy of our new catalogue? No, I don't. But would you send one? Yes, I'll pop one in with the order. You'll find it a lot easier to remember what you need if you have our catalogue in front of you next time. Yes, good idea. And when can you deliver this? Should be with you tomorrow morning. Can you make sure that it's not after 11.30am? Because we have to go out at 12. There's only myself here on Fridays. Fine. I'll make a note in the delivery docket that they should deliver before half past 11. Thanks very much. Thanks. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now it turns to part two. Part two. You'll hear a lecturer talking to students about a printing process. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. As I've made clear in earlier lectures, many different solutions have been proposed to the basic technological problem of getting meaningful marks onto paper. In other words, several different forms of printing have developed over the years, many of which are still in use today for different purposes. This week, I'd like to discuss the rotogravure process. This is one of the most widely used printing processes, and after describing how the process works, I'll be describing some of its industrial uses and the advantages and disadvantages of this form of printing. As the name implies, rotogravure is a form of printing in which large cylindrical pieces of metal rotate, while the paper to be printed passes between them. The paper is held in place against the printing surface by the impression roller. The weight of this roller is one of the factors that affect how much ink is actually transferred to the paper. Remember that this roller does not directly transfer ink onto the paper. The side in contact with the impression roller remains blank, and it's the other side of the paper which is actually the printed side. The impression roller presses the paper against the ink-bearing roller generally known as the gravure cylinder. This roller is etched or engraved using either a laser or a diamond-tipped etching machine. This creates a large number of tiny holes in the surface of the roller which hold the ink. The depth and size of these holes determines how much ink is picked up from the ink fountain, which the whole printing assembly rests in. How much ink is picked up in turn determines the density of the image produced. As it rotates, the lower roller picks up more ink on its surface than is required, and this needs to be removed before contact with the paper. A flat edge, called the doctor blade, scrapes against the surface and removes all ink which is not in one of the holes on the surface of the lower roller. This should lead to a clean image. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Now that we understand a little of the mechanics of rotogravure printing, I'd like to look at it in the wider context of the printing industry and discuss the main uses. One of the main advantages of the rotogravure process is that the amount of ink which can be transferred to the paper is high compared to other printing methods. This means that a broad density range can be produced. In other words, with rotogravure, it's possible to produce many different light and dark shades, making it particularly suitable for reproducing photographs and fine art. For shorter print runs, some other processes may give a finer image, but rotogravure is ideal for jobs that involve printing, for example, a million magazines. One common place where you'll see printed matter that has been produced by rotogravure is in the advertising material that is often inserted into Sunday newspapers. Of course, it's not just paper that can be printed by rotogravure. It's a very flexible process, since the rollers used can be made to any size required. Whether it's consumer packaging or large rolls of floor covering that need to be printed, rotogravure is a relatively cheap, quick method that is used in a variety of industries.
This isn't to say that rotogravure is without its disadvantages. Probably the main drawback is the fact that, with large areas of colour, the dots are visible, even without using any kind of magnifying aid. Now, does anyone have any questions about the rotogravure process? That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Hello, my name is Emiliano. I am a student here and I'd like to rent a house for six months. OK, well you've come to the right place. We specialise in short-term rental. First of all, I would like to get a few details from you. Can you give me your full name, please? Yes, it is Emiliano Nespla. And can you tell me your present address, please? Yes, it's 17 Middle Way, Penrose. I'm living with a homestay family at the moment. That's great. Now, do you have any identification with you? Oh, and we will need a reference from someone who knows you here. Maybe your homestay family. Yes, OK. Here's my passport and the card from my language school. My reference can be Mrs. Alice Thompson. She's my homestay mother and she would mind, I'm sure. You can contact her at the same address as me, of course. OK. If we need to contact you, should we leave a message with your homestay? No, you can speak to me directly. My cell phone number is 021-548-3534. Great. Now, do you have a bank account? You will need to pay your rent by direct debit. You know, it will come out of your account automatically every month. OK, I don't have my bank account details with me now but I can get them and bring them back later today. That's fine. Now, can you tell me what kind of house you are looking for? Do you want to rent by yourself? No, I'm looking for a three-bedroom house. I want to rent with my two friends. I will bring them in to see you later today. OK. And what areas are you interested in renting in? Well, here's a map. Can you see my school? I don't have a car, so I need to take some kind of public transport to school and I don't want to travel for more than 30 minutes each way. Do you think you have anything which is suitable? Yes, we do. Here is a list of available properties. I'll highlight the ones that could be of interest to you. Look at the map and go and have a look at the houses with your friends. Do you have a friend with a car? Yes, I do. Good. So go and look outside the houses. It will give you an idea of what the area is like. But remember, don't go into the garden or knock on the door. If you want to go in and have a look, let me know and we can arrange an appointment. OK. Can you give me an idea of price? Yes. If you look at the list, you can see the weekly rent written next to the house address. Oh, yes. I can see it now. Do I need to pay anything else? Yes, you need to pay a deposit which you will get back when you move out and you have to pay a non-refundable agent fee which is equivalent to one week's rent. You will have to pay your bills when they come in every month too, of course. OK, well, thank you very much for your help. What time should I come back with my friends and my bank details? How about 2.30 this afternoon? That sounds good. Thank you for your help. I'll see you later. Thanks for coming in. Goodbye. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30.
Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. Hey, don't throw that can away. Why not? I finished with it. Yes, but you can recycle things like that. Oh, I haven't got time to recycle everything I throw away. That's a terrible attitude. Don't you care about... Hello, you two. Hi, John. What are you arguing about? Oh, Sam says he doesn't have time to recycle. What do you think? Well, I agree that it can be difficult sometimes. Do you always recycle everything then, Mary? Yes, I think everyone should. I mean, look at the state of the planet. If we don't all start making an effort now, it could be too late. Well, one of the reasons I don't recycle as often as I should is that I don't really know where to go. There are no recycling facilities near me. Well, I know I said I haven't got time, but actually there is a bottle bank near the supermarket just up the road. So I suppose there are limited local facilities. So you can do your recycling outside the supermarket? Yes, but like I said, only limited. It's only a bottle bank. Well, I don't have a car, so it's very difficult for me, but I still do it. Sometimes a friend comes over and we take our recycling together, but not very often. So if your facilities are limited, then mine are very limited. Well, I suppose if you go to all that trouble, I might make more of an effort. Good. If it was up to me, I'd encourage more people to recycle. How? Well, how about some kind of incentive? A reward for anyone who makes an effort to recycle? That's a good idea. But if you think everyone should recycle, then why not penalise those who don't recycle instead of giving something to people that do? If there was a fine for anyone caught throwing recyclable materials in the rubbish, people would take more notice. Well, now you're going too far. Do you really want anyone going through your rubbish just to check if you're following the rules? No, I don't think fines are a good idea. Well, I think we should be doing something. Anyway, I have to go. I've got my social science class next. See you later. Yeah, see you later. Bye. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a postgraduate psychology student talking to other students about a job satisfaction study he has investigated. Before you listen, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen and answer questions 31 to 40. Good morning, everyone. For my presentation today, I'm going to report on an assignment that I did recently. My brief was to analyze the methods used in a small study about job satisfaction and then to make recommendations for future studies of a similar kind. The study that I looked at had investigated the relationship between differences in gender and differences in working hours and levels of job satisfaction amongst workers. For this purpose, employees at a call center had been asked to complete a questionnaire about their work. I'll summarize the findings of that study briefly now. First of all, female full-time workers reported slightly higher levels of job satisfaction than male full-time workers. Secondly, 
female part-time workers reported slightly higher levels of satisfaction than female full-time ones did. On the other hand, male part-time workers experienced slightly less job satisfaction than male full-time workers. But although these results seemed interesting and capable of being explained, perhaps the most important thing to mention here is that in statistical terms, they were inconclusive. Personally, I was surprised that the findings hadn't been more definite, because I would have expected to find that men and women, as well as full and part-time workers, would experience different levels of satisfaction. So I then looked more carefully at the methodology employed by the researchers to see where there may have been problems. This is what I found. First of all, the size of the sample was probably too small. The overall total of workers who took part in the survey was 223, which sounds quite a lot, but they had to be divided up into subgroups. Also, the numbers in the different subgroups were unequal. For example, there were 154 workers in the full-time group, but only 69 in the part-time group. And amongst this part-time group, only 10 were male, compared to 59 who were female. Secondly, although quite a large number of people had been asked to take part in the survey, the response was disappointingly low. A lot of them just ignored the invitation. And workers who did respond may have differed in important respects from those who didn't. Thirdly, as the questionnaires had been posted to the call center for distribution, the researchers had had very limited control over the conditions in which participants completed them. For instance, their responses to questions may have been influenced by the views of their colleagues. All these problems may have biased the results. In the last part of my assignment, I made recommendations for a similar study, attempting to remove the problems that I've just mentioned. Firstly, a much larger sample should be targeted, and care should be taken to ensure that equal numbers of both genders and both full and part-time workers are surveyed. Secondly, the researchers should ensure that they are present to administer the questionnaires to the workers themselves. And should they require the workers to complete the questionnaire under supervised conditions so that the possibility of influence from other colleagues is eliminated? Finally, as workers may be unwilling to provide details of their job satisfaction when they are on work premises, it's important that the researchers reassure them that their responses will remain confidential and also that they have the right to withdraw from the study at any time if they want to. By taking measures like these, the reliability of the responses to the questionnaires is likely to be increased, and any comparisons that are made are likely to be more valid. So, that was a summary of my assignment. Does anyone have any questions? That is the end of part four.